or be close to a nice big huge you know pool that the kids that you can just go down the street or ride your bike down there and you and the kids can swim and all that thing so that's the fun part for me so what we're going to do is we're going to go over this uh this one to four family contract which is this is this is a basic contract promulgated uh by the state of texas and we're just going to go through some quick uh points on it real quick First, you have the parties on the contract, which would be the seller. Uh, that's who's selling the home, who's, who's, who's it deed to at that point. You're going to be on the second line. Uh, first, you know, you, and if you're a spouse, your spouse. It's going to have the legal description, and then city, also known as, and then that's going to be the address. And what this does, it, it, it establishes a framework of the two parties and where y'all are going to meet in the middle and the title company is going to issue the title policy and that's further down but what the title policy does is it ensures that you put putting the contract on to purchase the home and the seller who's going to convey the deed to you you know after closing making sure there's no what's what we call like a clouded title meaning like uh, anybody, any claims on, on that they have on the property or anything like that. And, and they're going to do the abstracting and they're actually going to insure it so that you don't have any problems in the future when you're the owner. Then we go down to this other stuff is just, you know, improvements. I'm not going to go through all of that because most of that, like I said, it's promulgated by the state. There's been a series of, you know, lawsuits, if you will. Uh, because, and I feel very confident with the state of Texas and Houston Association because we're actually the model, even New York Association is behind ours. I mean, we are, we are it. When it comes to real estate in the whole country, Houston, Texas is it. And, you know, I feel proud of that. So, and we have, um, for Texas Association, it's, we, we just have the best. I mean, Texas is a big state. I mean, real estate is a major thing in this state. You know, we have everything from farmland, cattle ranch, investment, high rise, you know, anything you want. So, going on down. Number three, sales price. Cash portion at closing. This is going to be your down payment. Um, if, if we're going, if you get with Bill and he says FHA conventional, FHA is going to, of course, there's going to be 3.5% on that first line of the purchase price. So if, you know, for, for numbers, if you're saying, all right, we're going to get this, this house at $100,000, you are roughly going to be, what, three, I don't, I don't know, 3500 3, on that line right there. If, you're, if the purchase price is 100000 okay, so it's 3.5% for FHA. If you're going conventional, it's going to be 5%. Which, you know, y'all being familiar with Dave Ramsey, I mean, it's always better because they changed the laws recently, and Bill could allude to that, about no longer can you wait until you're 20% vested in the home to get rid of your mortgage insurance. This stays with the, with the, with the loan for life. Right, Bill? Very good. You learned. Well. Hey, see, I mean, he thought I wasn't listening. I was listening. <laughs> yes. And uh, so that this this right here is important. I mean, we're not doing the, you know, just hey, you know, like he said, getting anybody in the home. You guys are already prepped and ready. So you might want to consider that option. Five percent down will eliminate the uh, mortgage insurance premium. And that's that's a good thing because that can be what two hundred dollars per month, you know, depending on the, the 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 home that you buy, and that's a huge thing because we all know our most powerful wealth wealth building tool is your income, and we don't want to be paying bills all the time. We want to be invest. Eventually, we want to be investing. So, see, there, heart of a teacher. See, he caught that. I I do have the heart of a teacher. I mean, I didn't always know that, and now. You know, so, but now I'm finding out, okay? So, C, sales price, of course, is going to be there. Um, 
the sum of the financing. So you you deduct that in the middle. In the middle, you're going to have the difference from that, which is 96.5 or whatever. That's going to be on that line. And also, number four, financing. I'm going to check third party financing. And it's going to be, the, set, the middle line is going to be there, which is going to be w the amount that you're financing. So if, we, if you write on there, you're going to say 3500 on on line A. You're going to put, on C, you're going to put 100000 And then on B, for the sum, it's going to be 65, what is it? 65, no. uh, uh, 96, 5. I'm sorry. 96.5. On okay. 3B. On, th on 3B, yes. And on 4A. Mm -hmm. Trent, and there's then, a reason you have a numbers man connected yeah, to your right. Yeah, that's right. See, I told you, he's the left side, I'm the right side. <laughs> <laughs> math is never, I, I don't like math. I like calculators, <laughs> though, so we <laughs> established that. Um, <laughs> so you're going to put 96,500 on number 4. A, and then that first line, and then you get on number two. We're always going to check uh, this contract is subject to buyer being approved for financing described in, in, a t in the third party financing addendum. Okay, so because that's checked, that's alluding to the third party financing addendum, which it's exactly what it says it is. It's an addendum to the contract describing the terms of the financing. So what that's saying is it takes a little bit of time to, you know, get through that process. Is anybody lost? Am I losing y'all? Or is it too much information? Clear no? as mud. No. Clear as mud, right? <laughs> Everybody got it? Okay. So going on down, uh, assumption, seller financing, you don't really usually got to worry about that. Earnest money, okay? Upon execution of this contract by all parties, buyers shall deposit. This, on, the, on this first line, is going to usually be 1% of the purchase price of the home, which is? $1,000. He got it. $1,000. What if I only want to put $500 down? Who makes the decision on that? Well, usually it will be in the notes that they want 1%. What you know, like usually sellers do not want to take their their home off the market for anything less than one percent. Now that's just a, a kind of like an industry standard. What I do sometimes, if you have two thousand, I go ahead and say if if I know we're we're in a hot area like Spring or Katy or Sugarland, or you know, <laughs> virtually every sector of Houston is hot depending on where you go. And usually people come to me and they say. Here's where I want a house, and I go, okay. I'm like, wow, everybody wants a house in the same hot area. And so I know there's going to be multiple offers usually. And so what I tell them is when you put 2000 right there, the seller goes, okay, I got three other offers, and they're 1000 This one's 2000 I like that better. Because virtually you could have five offers that look all the same, but one difference is you said – Hey, I really appreciate you taking your home off the market. I'm gonna write you a check for two grand because I'm I'm more than confident. I'm gonna, you know, I got all my ducks in a row. I'm gonna close on that house, and you don't have to worry about me missing the closing. Follow what I'm saying? So that's a negotiating tool right there too. All these lines are negotiating tools, and the better your real estate professional is, the better you're gonna, you know, have that power to negotiate. Can I okay. do number six? Sure. Okay. So number six, the reason I'm interjecting in here, this is what I am going to be hard of a teacher of. This is what I want you to tell the realtor. I want the seller to do the title policy. Okay? Put an X on the seller. Um, we'll drop down there to survey. I want the survey to be paid for by the seller. Okay? That is typical and historical that the title policy and the survey are provided by a seller, don't, let, don't negotiate that out. It's not going to hurt your ability to win the bid on the house. Okay? Does that help you? That's good. Now, here's what I want you to tell your loan officer. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's, 
<laughs> we do this all the time. Good, good cop, bad cop. I'm going to call you back in years. Why don't you go back and tell him? <laughs> I have agents that come up and tell me, we lost the survey and the seller absolutely will not pay for it. I don't know why it is such a big deal to them. I guess they feel like inherently, even though, okay, we offered you 1500 more, what is the difference, right? They just feel like if you're the one buying the home, then you should pay for the survey because it's your home. The survey is going to be in your records. The title company, which they paid for, they paid for the title policy, and that is, that is very traditional. And if they didn't lose the survey, nine times out of ten, the title company can use that old survey, you know, because it's, I mean, you look at it, it's got the company, it's got their seal, it's usually good. Uh, every now and then they'll get an old one, over ten years old, that company may not be around anymore, and they say, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a bunch of lawyers, they go, no, I don't want to use that, let's get a new one. Yes. Is the survey the same as an inspection or different? No. Okay. The survey, here's what the survey is. The survey is the meets and bounds of the property, the legal, you know, to where it ends and where it begins. And sometimes um, it's funny because old surveys used to say the oak tree on the north side, and it was, this would actually be on the survey. They would use an oak tree or, or the, the ravine, the, the, the creek down there, and they would use, that's how they would uh, establish it. So th in this case, it's, it's mo mainly going to be so that you don't kind of encroach on your neighbor because you're in a master plan community or you're, you know, in a cul-de-sac and you just don't want to put a mailbox where, you know, your, your, your neighbor's property is, it's that kind of thing. So, and also so that they know where the easement begins and ends so that, you know, when you go to put a shed, you're like, babe, I want to put a shed in the back. You'll know exactly where you can come out and where you can place it so that, I mean, you, you really could do it anywhere you want, but if they come along and say, hey, we need to dig that up and get that, get that sewer line out of there, sorry, they're going to destroy your, you know, whatever. So the survey is very important. How much do they cost typically? The, the survey is going to be about four hundred and twenty-five dollars, typically, depending. And um, to me, I mean, you know, there there are investments you have to make. You're investing in the home. You want a title policy, and you got to have your survey. Uh, those are those are very important. And um, I want to talk about. Can I ask uh, a question real quick sure. before you? Yeah. Jump? So, uh, jump back to, to the point five. So, the earnest money um, is, is more than one percent really going to make a difference if you're doing a new build. So, if you're gonna have a builder actually, no, not I mean, no. Is it, I mean, I mean, it, no, there's no, no really, it's really, really to go, not. It's more no. if you're dealing with another like an existing home, kind of a company. kind of a resale, Got right? Because yep. okay. when you're doing a new home, and let me let me back up real quick. I gotta say something. The, the importance of a realtor. I'm not just saying that because I happen to be a realtor. Look, I was, I'll tell you just a, a slight background I have. I was a debt collector for over 10 years. And I had shotguns pulled on me. I had some crazy things happen to me. I had a job where I made a lot of money. But I, it was not a fulfilling job. It was very, you know, people would run from me. Even though I had certain clients, hey, how you doing? It would make me food, all this kind of stuff. It was very tough emotionally for me, but I was, you know, whatever. So I became a realtor and started working with buyers and sellers because I really, it's a more fulfilling job. I mean, the first five years, I made zero, nothing. I was just like, hey, this is a great experiment. I'm going broke. How you doing? You know what I mean? Like, it, it was like that. But the, the more important part is the fulfillment you get and the look on the face whenever you get them the home that they wanted. And it's like a process. It's a struggle. It's a, I mean, I, clients cry. I mean, cry to me. Oh, do you want to work with me anymore? I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't care that we've seen this many homes and you're getting discouraged. That's what I'm here for, to encourage you. 
because it's tough out there. It